All right, how's it going? You all ready? We're almost there. The final stretch is ahead. Um, first of all, thank you for making it this long. It's been a long day, a lot of awesome talks. Thank you, Ma Mary, Laura, everybody behind the scenes. Um, so let's get started. Your mouths may vary. Uh, 2014. Um, the spring of 2014 is where we're going to start. So I was, I co-founded a startup. I was the CTO. I had a distributed team, and we relied on text-based chat. We were using a product called Campfire. Anyone use Campfire? Remember those days? Yeah, so um, things are going well, and I, this new product, Slack, comes out. And everyone's like, oh, Slack, it's like so awesome. Like, you should check it out. And I'm like, we're good, we're good. Like, we're using Campfire, it's cool. And then they decide to sunset Campfire, it's going to go away. And I'm like, well, we need something else. Like, my team is all around the US. Like, we need, we need something. And you know when someone keeps telling you to use something, and you're like, you're like eh, and, you're, and then you become skeptical. You're like, can it really be that good? Like, come on. So, um, so we start using Slack. And I was like, OK, so it's pretty cool. Um, and at this time, you know, Slack was pretty early in the number of daily active users. So I, I didn't work there at the time. I didn't have any plans of working at Slack. And we start using it. And I start building on the platform, the developer platform. And I find errors in the APIs, not too many, but a few. I write into support, start talking to people that are working there. We're loving the product. Things are going pretty well. And a year later, I sell that company. And I needed, to, I needed a job. I needed to decide what to do next. So I looked at the home screen of my phone, and I, was, I, I said to myself, what are all the apps that I use every single day? And there was Slack. So in October 2015, I join. When I interviewed, they said, we don't have anyone for you to manage, but we're going to hire some people, so you can, you can manage them. I end up leading part of developer platform, that area that I really loved when I was an end user. And this was a time of increased pressure and growth. When you used apps before 2015 on Slack, you had to Google them, search them, find them. If you built an app, you had to host it yourself. And we were launching this app directory. It was the first time in the history of the company when we had an external deadline with a big press event. So I join, and they say, you know, don't screw it up. You've got to hit this deadline. It's in three months. <laughs> um, fast forward a year. Now we've had about 4,000 daily, excuse me, 4, 4 million daily active users. Um, engineering at this point, you know, when I joined, engineering was under 100 people. We're probably at about 200 people now. Um, and the biggest existential challenge of the company at that time was no longer developer platform, it was infrastructure. So the original infrastructure that the founders had built for Slack, it was designed for a product used by small and medium business. In the early days, at the beginning of this talk, I talked about all my startup friends. They were using Slack, small teams. And now we had much, much larger teams with thousands and thousands of people putting incredible stress on the product. And it was never designed to handle that kind of stress. So the CTO said to me, OK, Julia, build a new engineering organization. Find a bunch of people in the company who build infrastructure. Hire a bunch of people and help us get through this period of scale. So I spent the next two and a half years growing that organization from about 10 people to now around 103 offices. It was a period of incredible stress and incredible pressure, but we did really amazing things. And so all of the lessons that I will talk through, the things that I learned, is from this period. I now have a new job. I'm back in product engineering. I'm shipping product again. It's really awesome, and the challenges are wildly different. But when I look back at this curve that takes us through January, when, how we got to 10 million daily active users, this is what I think. The systems, the processes, how you did things, how work got done was so fundamentally different in 2014 than it is now in 2019. There were a lot of axes of this type of growth. And I think this is useful as I talk about how we navigated the growth. So first, there was customers, users, more and more people using the system. And that put horizontal pressure across all of our infrastructure, all of our web application instances, everything that we built. There was also this really highly verticalized growth. We used to shard by team, so by company. And so certain companies, 
they were really huge and they could take out a shard, especially at 8 a.m. on a Monday morning when everyone would come online. So this super verticalized growth. We then saw the rise of the platform. I talked about developer platform early on. People were building on top of Slack. They were, in, they were creating new apps. They were calling our APIs in really strange and unusual ways. <laughs> That's a whole other talk. <laughs> And finally, we're just, you know, load is everywhere. We're seeing incredible load. We're seeing um, long load times. And we really had to drive that down. Now, at the same time that all of this is going on, you know, um, we also, we're hiring. We're hiring a lot of people. Every week, new engineers are onboarding. We're building out a new engine, we're building new engineering organizations. We built out infrastructure, but we also had built some additional organizations. In 2016, our head of sales joined, and we built an entire sales team. How many of you are in enterprise and work with sales folks? So, like, that's an adjustment. <laughs> um, we opened new offices around the world, and we also did several acquisitions. I was an internal sponsor of an acquihire that we did to bring in some specialized infrastructure expertise. So we've got all this load that's happening on the system, Things are failing in strange ways. The platform is growing. We're hiring. People are onboarding. We're opening new offices. We're trying to sell the product. We're understanding how to interact with sales and marketing. So, whew. Oh, and we want to move fast and maintain velocity. How many of you, how many of that, uh, how, how many of you does that resonate with? Don't slow down. We wanted organizational agility. What I mean by that is, when you make a decision as an organization to move in a different direction or try things in a new way, immediately the organization is able to move in that direction. All the arrows are pointed in the same, in the same way. So we wanted to have fast, fast velocity. We all wanted to move in the same direction. There was constant change, and many of us were in the largest jobs of our life on these exponential learning curves. So, a lot of pressure. Now, um, I explicitly didn't put stress on this slide because I think pressure can be a really powerful motivator. Um, pressure to get things right, pressure to design right, pressure to be successful. But it was a very ta a time of a lot of pressure. And I often call it the time of no parachutes. Um, when I took on each role, building infrastructure, going to product, there was no going back. Um, if I failed, my old job was fundamentally different than before. We had to be successful. Our customers depended on us. I like this quote a lot because um, it really shows that we had to get it right. Not perfect, but we had to get it right. So how do we do it? Here's 10 takeaways, things that I learned that hopefully you all can take away today. First, so. I spent my entire career up until probably about 10 years ago writing code. I started writing code when I was about 12 years old on a Commodore 64. And I knew that moment that that was what I wanted to do with my life. I spent college and graduate school avoiding taking writing lessons or any English classes at all that I could get away with. I had to write papers, but let's face it, like they were pretty bad. And then I woke up one morning, and I was like, all I do right now is write English. And why do I write English? Because I think writing helps me clarify thought. You are at the lead dev conference. You might be managers. You might be tech leads. You might be official tech leaders. You might be unofficial tech leaders. But when you're in a leadership role, a lot of what you have to do is communication. Yvette highlighted this in her talk earlier. One of the ways that you can communicate is to write. It is one of many different ways. But before I communicate anything to my team, I always write it down first. I write my talking points down. Because when I talk to the team, if it comes out as this jumbled mess of phrases that are here and there and all over, I'll lose my credibility as a leader, and I won't be able to communicate the critical points that I need to get across. Most of the writing that I do is for myself. I don't share it with anyone else. I write down notes. I kind of structure them. I'll go into a meeting. Um, and some of these meetings might have 100, 200 people in them. There might be a third of the folks that joined the company in the past month. 
so they might not have any of the context or background. And so I'm communicating to this broad audience, so I always write it all down first. I gave this um, suggestion to a newer manager I work with, and he was like, I don't have anything to write about. And let me tell you, in the beginning, I didn't have anything to write about, and now I have, all I do is like, have overflowing lists of things to write about. One of the things I'll do after this conference is write down my takeaways and share them with my team so they can hear what it was like. Um, so I, t I talked about how most of my life has been nerding out and being in computers. And I, about, about two years ago, I started managing someone who was very, very senior. And he had been hired as a manager and he transitioned to an individual contributor role. And he was very prolific in the community. And he comes up to me and he's like, Julia, you need to tell more stories. And I was like, what are you, what are you talking about, dude? And, and he's like, stories are a very, very powerful way for you to communicate to the team that's not just platitudes about leadership, but are rooted in things that are actually meaningful. And so I started thinking about this, and I'm like, okay, I need to tell more stories, I need to tell more stories. And then I realized that a lot of my job is actually this really dirty word to engineering, it's called sales. So I, I try not to say sales to engineering-oriented audiences, I say evangelism. <laughs> so a big part of my job is evangelism. So who am I evangelizing to? Well, engineering is now, I, it's hard to keep track, five to 600 people. We have a lot of different organizations. And many of them say, like, what does your org do? And I need to be able to tell the story. This is why we're here. These are, these are the projects we're working on. Here are our ambitious goals. I spend an incredibly large amount of time on the phone. Who on earth am I talking to? I'm talking to candidates. I talk on the phone so much that I have one of those like fun Bluetooth headsets and it dies every single time. And I'm talking to these candidates, I'm telling them the story about why they should join, about what we're working on, about why it's important. And that ability, that, that ability to tell a powerful story, you can learn it. I was not actually very good at this for most of my life. I'm still not that great, but I'm always practicing what is my story, how do I root my narrative? Because at the end of the day, I'm doing sales. Now, um, we talked a lot at the conference about communications and the power of communicating. Communicating in different ways and using different mediums. So imagine you know, you're writing code and you write a bunch of code and it's kind of, maybe it's kind of rough, you know, you're, you're like, you're in your zen, you're like in the zone, you write all this code. You're in a large organization, you've got a, a product that has SLAs around uptime. Do you just deploy that code? I mean, hopefully you have processes that go through checks, you have tests, but imagine you're writing communications. You're writing about something really important that will directly impact people's lives. Ideally, you've you know, talked to those directly impacted in person before. But you've got your big communications plan. Do you just hit send to your whole company? That's, that's what I would say the equivalent process of what's, what's your deployment for communications. So I'm a really big fan of having communication plans. And I, again, analogy here would be like, what's your deployment process for, your, for all that English that you're writing? Um, you can keep it really simple. A few years ago at Slack, I wrote like bare bones communication template because we had to communicate a lot of changes. When you're going through rapid growth, when you're going through a lot of change, all the time, change management, what's happening next? Right now, we, we even, we're doing so many changes that we have to have like a calendar because we wanna make sure that we're not communicating over someone else's communication because so much is happening. So I highly advise, have a deploy process for your communications, create a template, it can be simple. That's an example, go from there. So on the, to on the topic of communications, um, about two, excuse me, three years ago, we hired a vice president of engineering at Slack. And, um, and this person joined to be my boss, and I was very excited 
because we hadn't had a VP of engineering. Um, we all had reported to our CTO, we hire a VP. And they tell us, you know, the, so it's, it's Michael Lopp, you know, he's spoken at these conferences, and I was super jazzed, because I was like, I've read his books, it's really famous, so, so he joins. And like, you know, I'm, I, I'm really nervous, because I'm like, oh, I want, I want to make a good impression. Like, so I, I tell him, and I'm running developer platform at the time, I'm like, how about I, I write you like some docs so you can understand platform and what it's like? And he's like, yeah, that sounds great. So I like agonize over this. I'm like, what should go in the documents? Like, should I do a PowerPoint? Should I like write something for him? Oh, should I talk about the people? Should I talk about the projects? Like, what should I do? So I'm agonizing and agonizing. And I eventually write, and I, I, I still have it. I, I was just looking at it. I write this like terrible PowerPoint presentation <laughs> about like the organization. And, and it's like, real, it, it's just a mess. And I'm talking to my, uh, my coach about this. And she's like, did you talk to him and ask him what he cares about and what he wants to know and if he wants a presentation or not? And I was like, no, I, I didn't do that. <laughs> And so every time now I'm thinking about communications, I always ask the people that I'm talking to, hey, what's top of mind for you? Now, I might know that for my team. Like, I spend a lot of time down with my team. And most people are used to um, the man like line manager direct report communication. But it's much harder when you go sideways. And it's like this dark art when you go um, up. So when I'm, at, when, I'm, when I'm doing comms or I'm thinking through a discussion topic sideways, I spend some time asking, you know, what do you care about, what's top of mind, and what's the format that you want? Some people love the written Amazon six-page document. Some people are like, no, just, just throw up a presentation. And this is especially important, I've found, when you're communicating up to executives. I had a, a meeting with our CTO at one point. And our CTO is a deep, deeply, deeply technical person, and he gets really excited about technology. So I had this whole plan where I was going to talk to him about how we're thinking about our new caching layer and how we're going to roll it out. So I go into the meeting, and I'm like talking about the caching, and I, he's sitting in the back, and then I'm like, oh no, like this, like uh, he kind of crosses his arms, and I'm like, oh no, it's coming. And he says to me, this is great. So what's your plan with the head count? <laughs> How are you thinking about your head count distribution? Now are you thinking about, and I'm just like, damn it. I should have asked him what was top of mind, because then I would have known it's all about head count. <laughs> and it's not about the cache, although the cache is pretty cool. <laughs> Shout out to the amazing engineers who built it. It was not me. Um, all right, too many meetings. So. We're growing really fast. We're building new organizations. We have some process. We don't have a lot of process. And suddenly, now how many, how many of this relates? Suddenly, like something goes off the rails, and like this organization builds something, and this organization is like, oh my gosh, that's going to break what we built. You can't, like, you can't deploy that. Like, that's, that's going to make, that's going to break the API contract with developers if we do this. And that group is like, we had no idea. Oh my gosh. And everyone's like, okay, we got to come together and we got to solve this. Like, we're going to come together. So we come together and then we're like, okay, we're going to meet every single day and talk about this. <laughs> and that's, at, that's not far from what happened. So, we kind of, we had this moment where it was like, we, we had like just-in-time process, just-in-time process, and then like a big event happened, and we were like, whoa, we need to come over here, and we need to have process for everything, and we need to like meet all the time, and every single sub-team needs to have cross-functional meetings with every other sub-team. Like, this actually happened. And so it was like N-squared sub-team meetings, and, so, and we, had, we had channels, we had sub-team meetings, and suddenly, um, we took a step back because eventually, people, like, you couldn't actually schedule the sub-team meetings anymore because everybody's calendar was booked all the time with these N-squared meetings. And so um, we're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. So, um, so what's the actual problem here? And the root of the cause, and you know, it's complex, was that we had had, in, in, in that phase of growth, organizational drift. And we were not aligned, and nobody really understood what some of the other organizations were going to do. Um, 
We, had, we hadn't used OKRs, we've transitioned to OKRs at this point, but every single suborg had like 20 goals for the quarter, and every, it was like raining goals. And, and so th at that point, we, we'd made a lot of changes, but we transitioned to OKRs, that was just, just one thing, but we also started thinking about, do we need all these like endless cross-functional meetings? And like cross-functional meetings are, are very important, but if you're like, if, if you've got engineers who are like, why do we have all these meetings? If you as a manager, as a leader are like, why am I going to all these meetings? Think about if you're actually aligned on the goals that you are meeting those people with. I touched on this a little bit in five, but it's that notion of um, overcorrection, of you know, maybe you're a small company and you're like, process, we don't need that. Like there's five of us, we're all in a room, we know what's going on. And then you grow and you hit like 30 people. I feel like 30 people is a point when suddenly like everything that worked um, before it starts to break down. And then I think, I feel like it happens like 75 or 100 people, that process breaks down. And so you're like YOLO lightweight in the beginning, and then you over, you, you do the like n squared over, over correction, and then you kind of come back. And I remember this moment um, early in Slack where our CTO interviewed every single candidate. Does that, are you, some of you in that phase? I still remember my interview with the CTO. There's a whole, I'll give a whole talk about it sometime. It was, it was good, it was intense. Um, and so he's interviewing everybody. And finally, like, kudos to him, he, he gets to the point where it's just like, it's like not possible for him to do that anymore. And so we create an interview slot that's like shaped around the interview that he gave. And so I, I'm one of the people who is gonna do that interview slot. And so he gives me this like three page document. And he's like, here is how I'm thinking about this, this slot. Here's the structure, here's the process. And I was like, whoa, like, this is great. And he's like, why are you surprised? I do that. I've done this hundreds of times. Like, it has to, I have to have this down. And I was like, that's, that's a really excellent point. And so when I looked in our applicant tracking system, in the first two and a half years at Slack, I interviewed 300 people. And so I had to have a process for that. And I had to understand how to do it well. And the feedback loops are really tight if you're doing something really, really rapidly. And you can find a really good process. Now, the other end of the spectrum is, so you, we were at this phase where I was like, okay, we're doing the N squared meet, like we're gonna have process, we're gonna figure this out. Um, the other end of the spectrum is, we would start to want to inject process into things we would do like once a year. And so then we had to really do the calculation of is it worth having a really great process? Um, one, of the, one of the foundational things that I was part of that was really interesting to watch was how we do M&A, so like mergers and acquisitions. How do we acquire companies and what's the process for that? And that was something where we really had to evolve and change as our strategy evolved and changed for M&A. How many of you have a decision that needs to be made in your organization right now and you don't actually know who can make that decision? <laughs> uh, when we, um, when we started adding you know, so many folks, one of the things that started happening is it became really unclear who could make decisions. Um, you know, we have a CTO, we also have a chief architect, we have several principal engineers, we have senior staff engineers, we have managers, we have tech leads, um, and we have, to, we have career ladders, roles are defined, but there were some of these really hard technical decisions where we didn't actually know who could make the decision. And one of the signs that you have, um, you have a challenge around who the decision maker is, is decisions go to a place called decision purgatory. So like in decision purgatory, there's often a lot of meetings, like a lot of meetings, but the meetings don't seem to yield any sort of outcome. Um, and then, the, and then, and then what, what can happen is, then there's an escalation. So like, you're like, okay, we need to go, we're not, nobody, it's not clear if anyone, any of us can make the decision, so we need to go higher up the stack. So we'll go to the next layer of like senior people, and you're like, can you make the decision? And they're like, whoa, that's like a hard decision. <laughs> and, and it could, and I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, one of them was, are we gonna use gRPC or Thrift? And it's a big decision, it has a lot of ramifications. How are we thinking about that decision throughout our infrastructure? So like the decision keeps getting like escalated up. And uh, once it gets to the, the, the most senior levels, you know, if, you're, you know, if you're at a company of you know, 1,500, 2,000, thousands of people, 
you're pretty, and you're an executive, you're pretty far from the front lines, and you're pretty far from a lot of the code. And so like these decisions go up, but then if you're a technologist and you're on the front lines, or you're a, first, a front line manager, you probably have a lot more information than the people up here do about what's really going on. And so suddenly, if you don't have clear decision makers and a clear decision making process, the people who are making these decisions might not be the best people to make them, but they're often left with no choice because it's gotten escalated all the way up. So in this case, it kind of escalated up, and then it started to escalate back down because the CTO was like, I need, I, these three people need to go in a room and, that per, and you need to come out of that room with a decision because you are closest to the problem. Um, and that actually worked pretty well for us, but then we had to figure out like, what are the decisions we can make um, and how should we make them? And I'm in a lot of meetings now uh, especially cross-functional meetings, where we're like debating some, in, in a, like, it may be a marketing strategy, because we're thinking about how are we gonna market some of the, the enhancements of the product, and it's very unclear who can make these decisions. And so then I'm like, all right, who can make the decision? And then we all look at each other, and then I'm like, I'll make it, and then marketing's like, no, we'll make it, and then I'm like, yes. <laughs> that, was, that was like kind of a joke. Um, This is something that I've been thinking about a lot in the past couple years. Um, when you are a, a senior person, when you're a leader, formally, informally, you know, engineering leader, engineering manager, um, if you're pretty tenured in an organization that's growing and you have a lot of visibility, you suddenly get a lot of credit for things. And the credit may not be because you actually did anything, it's because you're leading a team and that team did amazing things. And if you're new to an organization and you're really senior, you often want that credit because you're like, I'm new here, I want to prove myself. But a lot of my job and a lot of what I coach a lot of the, the principal engineers and other managers on our team about is credit will naturally flow to you when you're a visible senior person. It is your job to ensure the people their credit is not flowing to, that they get the credit, the visibility, and the recognition. I have a principal engineer who reports to me who has been really instrumental in helping us rethink our database sharding and storage strategy. And he leads a team of other individuals. And at first, he was the one going to a lot of the meetings, and he was the face. But everyone got to know him, but they didn't know a lot of the people on the team. And so now only the team will go to present that type of work. Because he's always in the discussions. And there's probably people, as you're thinking about your orgs, where the credit always flows to them. You're like, that, that person, they're good. It's the other people in the organization that really need you to bolster and support them and bring them up. And those are often people from underrepresented groups. And so it becomes even more important that they have that visibility. Two final stories before the happy hour. When I was in graduate school, I studied under a woman who was a fellow at IBM. And to be a fellow at IBM, it was a really, really big deal. She was one of the most senior technologists at the company. And the first job I had out of graduate school was at IBM Research. So I go to her, and I remember sitting, having lunch with her, and I say to her, Diane, you worked at IBM for 25 years, you became a fellow, you like got to the highest position ever, I'm about to go to IBM, tell me all the secrets of your success. So I like, take out my notebook, I'm like, ready to write them down. And she said, there's one thing above all others that you need to know. When you join an organization, look at the leaders of that organization. If it's a startup, it may be the CEO, CTO, it's a bigger company, maybe your department head. The people who emulate the behaviors of those folks who are more similar to them, they will be promoted much faster in the organization than the people who are not similar to them. So if, you're run, if your organization is run by someone very extroverted, very aggressive, extroverted, aggressive people will often be promoted much more often than introverted, like passive people. And this is a really powerful thing because the first thing that I then started doing was asking those leaders, what is your biggest weakness? And how are you then 
compensating for that weakness in the hiring process and in the evaluation process of the, your people. We recently hired a new SVP, and I was talking with him last week, and we met him at a big dinner. And he sits down, he's sitting next to me, and I'm like, Alan, and we had had some nice chit chat with each other. I'm like, Alan, so what's your biggest weakness as a leader? <laughs> and, he, and he's like, whoa, so all right, let's do this. <laughs> I'm talking with him last week, and he's like, yeah, I could tell, like, you were, you were going to hold me to, to um, my leadership principles because you know, that's, if that's your leading question, like, like you, you're not here to mess around. <laughs> so I encourage you to think about if you are a leader and you're building organizations, how are you ensuring that you're not over-indexing for people who are like you? We all love ourselves. Ensure you're not hiring people that look like you, that talk like you, that went to the same schools as you. How are you hiring people who are different than you because diversity build, diverse organizations build better products and they are much better teams? So on November 6th, 2016, the world changed. Does anyone remember what happened on that day? It was the U.S. presidential election. Um, before 2016, I would have thought, of course, we need to treat people fairly and with respect. Of course, it is incredible privilege for me to work with these folks that at any moment, any of us could leave and go to another tech company. But ever since that day, I thought about how important it is every single day to live and breathe your values and your morals and your principles. And a big part of that is treating people fairly and with respect. Laura Hogan has a great blog post about managing in terrible times. I encourage you to read it and to think through how much the world is different and how you want to take that into your leadership and how you treat people. With that, thank you.